Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Just so you know, we're already recording. Yeah. So good. feel free to be completely inappropriate from this point on. <laughs> Today, I'm speaking to Ariane Shireen. Uh, she was a stand-up comedian, she's a comedy writer. She was responsible for the Atheist Campaign uh, in 2009 on the sides of buses in London and all around the rest of the world. Uh, she's the author of several books. Uh, the new one is entitled Shitcom. And next year, she has a new album coming out called Bitter. So take a look. I'm already being in, 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 inappropriate today, Jack. Okay. I've got, look, look what I've got in bed with me. <laughs> That's not inappropriate. I'm still in bed. <laughs> I've eaten half of them today. <laughs> you're, yeah, but you're talking to a fellow ad addict, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not, not going to resonate with me. I've probably had a box of them in one go before. <laughs> I doubt that. You look oh. quite trim. Oh, no, lockdown has completely destroyed me. Well, I was fat before lockdown. <laughs> now I'm even fatter. So, well, I'm you know. At least you can say you got something out of lockdown, some extra padding. <laughs> yeah, and a heart right? pack. Keep you warm yeah. in the winter. <laughs> I literally gained about, I think, two, two and a half stone or something in lockdown. It's crazy. I can beat that. Go on. <laughs> I'm the fattest I've ever been. I'm 15 stone. Okay. All my breathing is like up here. It's really shallow. I can't breathe deeply anymore. I'm going to lose half my body weight next year. Okay. I'm going to go from 15 to seven and a half stone. That's that's a lot to lose. I know, but that's that's my natural weight, seven and a half, because I'm I'm five foot two. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's I'm tiny. About, yeah, yeah. I'm really tiny. So I'm going I'm still going to be in the healthy BMI at seven and a half. Okay. I'm just going to be able to breathe properly. <laughs> that would be nice. I've had a I've had a parallel experience. Same the whole exactly everything you described: the breathing, the fatness, the fifteen stone. That's all me. <laughs> yeah, but you're tall. I bet you're taller. How tall are you? Oh yeah, I'm six two. <laughs> well, exactly. That's fine. And <laughs> no, look, that's... you don't have these huge bazumbas. They're like so <laughs> massive. I swear. They're like you know. I can't go on a trampoline. I would die. Yeah. Like boom. <laughs> I can't run. Black eyes. Yeah. I, I knew I had a strange feeling that this would turn into a therapy session. <laughs> you told me to be inappropriate. So I just showed you my tits. There's no, it's not much more inappropriate than that, is it? I love it. So, oh, oh. so this podcast, is it for creative people or just anybody who takes your fancy? It started off as a, um, it started off on my Instagram where I, where I was putting up my photography. Right. And I hit like 3,000 followers on Instagram for the photographer. And then I thought, well, I'll parlay that into a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but, then, but then I had, uh, but I, I, I was debating backwards and forwards whether or not to make it a photography podcast. And then, but then I thought I'm, I, my, my attention span is terrible. And, and I have, I'm interested in different things from week to week. So yeah, um, yeah. I just thought I'll just start doing it. And at that time I was reading Casanova's autobiography, the famous Ooh. Giacomo Casanova. The Ooh. greatest lover and seducer of all time. Um, so I started off by interviewing a series of um, authors and actors around the topic of Casanova. And now it's kind of spread into other areas. And it was interesting with you because I think I've been following you on Facebook for quite a long time. I, mu I think Hi. I must have. I think I must have um, uh, come across you with the whole atheist thing. Uh, yeah. So I think I followed you from then. And then I just occasionally, I was just, I'd follow you and then I'd read your things occasionally. And I was like, oh, she's really funny. She's really funny. Aww, she's really funny. Thank you. And then I sort of, that got me more interested in you. And then I thought, oh, she's funny and she's an author. And I was like, funny and an author, that's podcast material. <laughs> but then Aww. as I was digging even deeper, it's like, I've probably been aware of stuff that you've done for a really long time and, and not necessarily known it, like two pints of lager and all that kind of stuff as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been around a long time. I'm like, I've I've had my my career has now spanned two decades, which is, is right? terrifying, terrifying. So for like, how would you boil down what you do then? Because now you uh, you have a new album coming out next year as well. Yeah. So, so I, I can't really boil down what it is you do. So what do you do? <laughs> so I've pop. always wanted to be a pop star. Okay. Always, always, always since I was 12 years old. Okay. 
And I suppressed that because there were no Asian female solo pop stars when I was trying to make it when I was 21. And I thought, do you know what? I will do work experience at the NME. So I did that during my music production degree. And they said, you're good at writing. Do you want to write some reviews for the magazine? And I was like, well, if I can't be a pop star, being a writer seems to be not quite as glamorous. No, it's pretty substitute. cool. It's pretty, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because at the time I was singing and playing piano in lounge bars around London and hotels. And it was pretty grim. You'd only get paid like 60 to 80 quid a night. Okay. You'd be playing for like four or five hours nobody would really listen to you. You were just the background. And I thought, well, if I don't make it as a pop star, I'm either doing this or I'm working on cruise ships. And both of them sounded quite depressing, especially because I get seasick. And I thought, (laughs) if I I become a writer, I don't have to go on cruise ships. I don't have to- um, I have to leave the house. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I can sit in bed. I'm in bed right now. You know, you can see that I've got chocolate on my um, it is chocolate. I promise. <laughs> it's, it's explosion has happened there at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, I um, I thought it was a, a good fallback. And so I became a TV writer. I, I entered a competition that I saw. Um, I was in the Q&HMV because I love music so much and I wanted to be a pop star, but I saw this booklet and it was for the BBC and it had competitions in it. And one of them was this script writing competition and the new sitcom writers award. This is the part of your CV that I think I'm most envious of. I would have loved to have done that. I tried to get into the BBC a bunch of times writing things and I had zero interest in anything I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was miserable. Honestly, I really didn't enjoy it. Oh, really? I I put all the- That makes me feel better. (laughs) <laughs> well I, I wrote a book called Shitcom about how um it's a novel but it, um the uh, the nice main character there's two main characters one of them's a villain and one of them's the um protagonist you know the hero and um the nice main character he his experiences were basically my experiences distilled into like his character okay. um and I made him as different from me as possible. So like he's ginger and Northern. So he's just trying to distance himself from me. Yeah. Um, so that was um, kind of cathartic writing all kind of my experiences into his character. Um, but yeah, I, I worked for um, the BBC for six years and I wrote the the letters that they read out on Countdown that were meant to be sent in by audience members, but it was actually me. <laughs> I, knew, I knew they were lying the whole time. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, Richard Whiteley had no idea. So Did he, he not- didn't know that they were just like completely fictional letters. Was that like, was that like a big thing? Like, don't tell, Rich- don't tell Richard. Yeah, yeah, it was Don't Tell Richard. And I think at the time, if like the Daily Mail had got hold of it, it would have been a huge scandal. But of course, it was so far back in the day that I think I'm okay to say it now. You know, it's not. It's it's just one of those, you know, telly secrets that like um, I was working for a sitcom and they did a phone vote. They did. They did a phone vote to decide the fate of a character who had already been saved in the script. Okay. So it was like, should they die? Should they not die? Yeah. But <laughs> actually, you know, he'd been contracted for a second series. So it was like, <laughs> well. <laughs> so they just rigged it then, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything like, don't trust anything you see on telly. Like so right. much of it is rigged and so much of it is fabricated. And even when you've got like talk shows, like um, current affairs shows where, two people are fighting right yeah um basically you'll have a researcher or a producer who's like we want you to take this angle we want you to go in really hard we want you to like you know completely sort of tell the other person exactly what you think of them and they kind of g you up to do that Mm -hmm. so it's all kind of manipulated it's not (laughs) <laughs> it's not real I mean even if you did hold that view you're encouraged to really like espouse it in the hardest possible way and if you don't hold that view then like people go on like journalists researchers go on you know forums and they say I'm looking for somebody who to say this 
So I'm looking it's for outrageous, to offensive on. statement. Does anyone feel that way? Great. Exactly. And then sometimes they say, oh, we've got 200 quid, 300 quid fee. <laughs> so like if you didn't feel that way before you might decide to feel that way if you're on universal credit or people are saying oh if you've got a, a dad who's a film lecturer you must know lots of people in the industry I did not know a single person I had to make yeah. all my contacts myself and weirdly I actually went on to meet people who he had taught like Charlie Brooker oh, really? and John Ronson yeah and I was like do you remember oh, my dad and they're like yeah John Ronson's we awesome. remember yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were like, yeah, we remember your dad. Wow. It's like so random. <laughs> yeah, that's really great. He's one, I think he's one of my favourite authors, John Ronson. I love his book. Yeah? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he's great. Um, I particularly liked um, So You've Been Publicly Shamed because yeah. I think it is so, it's so kind of on the nose for today. And it's quite depressing the way that like social media works now where you say the slightest thing wrong or you've said the slightest thing wrong a decade in the past yeah and boom you've got like a hundred thousand people on your case like yeah. saying the most horrible things to you and it's like wow that's um Pretty that's not something problem. yeah it's back it always reminds me of um Frankenstein with the villagers chasing him at the end and they all burn down the castle with him and it's, it's just that we've just regressed back to that village mentality haven't we Absolutely, or Edward Scissorhands at the end as well. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, where they all turn up at his castle, yeah. Because I had such extremes in my life. Like I had this, you know, this kind of sensitive, caring dad who would just turn into an absolute kind of terrorist and and absolutely um, shock and frighten and hurt um, and cause so much pain physically and mentally to his kids and his wife um, that I think it's no surprise that I grew up writing like fiction and writing drama and doing kind of confessional journalism because there's such extremes to all those things and you know the best fiction and the best drama and the best comedy is always so big and so colorful um and that was what my life was it was so dramatic um especially compared to your normal mundane everyday life yeah. um so i think it's kind of no surprise that i immersed myself myself in in those worlds because expressing how i felt and expressing what had happened in my life kind of made sense to it made sense to write scripts and and stories um a because it's cathartic to like let everything out and be creative and b because I had these such extremes of emotion that putting them on the page kind of made sense to me yeah did you find any um because you 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 wrote a, th a book about therapy as well didn't you yeah uh, yeah 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 is that is, is that how you ended up doing that because you were kind of yeah. dealing with these emotions did you find any for because looking at lots of to save me time going looking at all the therapies <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> did you find any of them helped you integrate those two sides because that's probably the only thing you can do with them isn't it is integrate it into a whole and kind of move forward in that way were any of them useful for those kinds of emotions that you had I mean feel, yeah you could you feel free to say no because we won't <laughs> <laughs> no I didn't get any benefit <clears throat> So I was in therapy for 23 years, mm. from the ages of 15 to uh, 38. Okay. And that was on and off because nobody can afford therapy for 23 years unless they're like a millionaire. Um, and but some you, of it was really helpful. Well. You were paying for it, it wasn't? I was paying for some of it, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, some of it was on the <laughs> NHS. Um, and... I found some of it really helpful. Some of it was actually traumatic and sort of worse than not having therapy. Um, yeah. But I would say that therapy can be very useful, but if you're really far gone in the head like I was because of all the shit that happens in my life, you need meds because meds are the only thing that's going to like put your biochemistry right because my brain chemistry is so fucked. <laughs> like there's just, 
it's kind of like no hope for me if I'm not on meds now. So I've been on meds do for... Uh, do you think you're going to have, on in an ongoing way, you're going to have to be on meds, do you oh, think? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I've been on meds um, non-stop for 11 years now. I'm on antipsychotics. I'm on anticonvulsant, which is an anxiolytic. And um, I'm on uh, antidepressants. Okay. Tricyclic antidepressant. So I'm on this cocktail every single day, probably for the rest of my life. Um, it's one of the things that's stopping me going and living in America. I'd love to go and live in America. My dad was American. I can't <laughs> oh, afford right. the men if I'm over there. Okay. And getting insurance for like a pre-existing condition is difficult. Um, so basically I'm kind of stuck here until I like make a load of money and then I can go over there and just like buy up all the meds. <laughs> but I think, um, I think that, well, maybe that would be the worst thing that happened if you had a load of money and could access any medical <laughs> care you wanted. <laughs> maybe that, maybe you're being kept there for a reason. <laughs> the irony is I absolutely, I hate drugs. Yeah. Um, they yeah. scare me. Um, I don't want to be on them, but they have fixed my brain to the extent that I can function normally in society. Okay. Whereas if I wasn't on them, I'd be absolutely do lally. So it's a good job that I am. Um, but with the therapy, I mean, I think it can do a lot of good, especially if you have mild to moderate conditions, yeah. um, mood disorders, um, depression, anxiety, etc. cetera. Um, but I think... Once the damage is done, it's very hard to repair. And if it's been done when you were a kid and if you've experienced extreme trauma for like 10 years and that was during your formative years, then it's only going to do so much, really. You can talk about it all you like, but your brain has been formed in a certain way. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a question of coping with, your illness rather than curing it yeah. um yeah it's it's difficult but at the same time I've got a very happy life I mean most of that's due to the drugs but um I love my my little girl she's amazing she's 10 years old now she's she's hilarious um yeah. and um I'm seeing a bloke um I don't know quite what's going to happen there but I'm wearing his t-shirt right now um <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he's so what, sweet. What and t-shirt is it? Is it something? It says, what does it say? Ken Moore, Ken Moore Air Harbour. He oh, likes planes and he wants to get his, his pilot's license. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he just left it at my house, so I've been wearing it. It's nice and snug. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, he treats me really well. He's like the kindest, most loving guy. Never had an argument with him. Um, care about him. He contacts me all the time, which is great. Um, and he can accept my honesty. And I think, I think the the one thing that the one thread that runs throughout the whole of like my creative career, if you wanted to link it all together is just that I'm unusually honest about my emotions and about how, well, yeah, how I feel about things. And, and um, even within like fiction, that's generally based on facts. Like I've generally channeled part of myself into that fiction. Yeah. Um, and with my songs, they're all true. So um, <clears throat> he can deal with like me just putting stuff out there and I think a lot of people can't like a lot of people are like, I'm a private person. I don't want you broadcasting my shit. And I'm yeah. like, well, I'm sorry, but that's what I do. So, you know, maybe don't go out with me or don't be friends with me or like I was going to be a therapist at one point. Okay. And um, one thing that stopped me being a therapist was like my imagination, because I thought, what if like I always have these horror scenarios in my head because it's like my brain trying to protect me from all the things that I've been through so it kind of envisages these horror horrific scenarios and one of my scenarios was like what if I'm a therapist and someone comes in and they tell me something they're not meant to tell me like say they're a spy right. they tell me some kind of national secret <laughs> and then they have to kill me <laughs> I was like I I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to be you you've mixed with a lot more um comedians than I I don't I don't know any comedians. I've always leaned that way in my kind of personality and the kind of things that I like. 
I love comedy. I love feeling that I'm witty. I'm not going to claim to be witty. I'm going to, I love feeling that I have been witty. Um, oh, I think you're pretty and, witty. And the way you're describing almost everything is very similar to how I am. And nobody else usually relates to that. So <laughs> is, is what you're describing there what you find amongst a lot of comedians? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, all comedians are broken. <laughs> They're broken yeah. people. Yeah. And... Um, I mean, there are some that are stable and well adjusted, but they're very much in the minority. And I think that, again, it's that sort of binary polarization that allows comedians to be very dramatic about things and then turn them on the head and surprise you with a joke. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I know so many comics who are unhappy. In fact, I know so many celebrities who are unhappy. Um, a lot of celebrities are unhappy because they they don't live normal lives. Um, they can't go out without somebody wanting a selfie or pointing a camera in their face or asking for an autograph or just besieging them. So they can't just live freely. It must be um, it must be horrific to be in that position. I would hate that. I love the idea of being famous, but without the attention bit. <laughs> 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 I just, yeah, all the, I all think, the money and lack of having to do a night to five <laughs> sounds brilliant but the rest of it sounds horrible yeah absolutely and also people have no sympathy for you because they're like <laughs> if you're famous then you've put yourself in that position therefore you deserve everything that you get you know yeah. thrown yeah. at you and um they feel that the, the celebrities made this trade-off because they don't have to work they don't have to earn money the normal way and therefore they deserve to be like just thrown a load of criticism and and you know threats and all the rest of it and it's their fault yeah. um which of course it isn't but i think it's very difficult because I, you've you've touched on it like there's a sweet spot where you are recognized for what you do by your peers and you have this cult success and you're earning maybe 50 to 80k and you're in a good place but you're not recognizable kind of on the street by most people yeah and you can live your life normally and freely i suppose it's like um maybe i'd call it like the saint etienne principle so yeah. like if you think of the band saint etienne right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. everybody's heard of them but nobody can recognize them. <laughs> so if, if Sarah Cracknell yeah. and if, if St. Etienne were walking down the street, nobody's like pointing, going, oh my God, that's St. Etienne. Yeah. Nobody's like shoving cameras in their face, but they're earning a good living. They probably don't have mortgages anymore. And um, they can play gigs. They don't, they can do what they love for a living. That's what I want. I want to be like St. Etienne. <laughs> that would be awesome, wouldn't it? The arts are so massively competitive. Yeah. And, you know, I received some like kind of snarky comments like, oh, oh, well, of course you did well at the BBC. They love like diversity and they're going to promote like brown women. I mean, there's just a real dearth of minorities actually wanting to be comedy writers because like we're <laughs> like, we're sort of pressured by our parents like even my parents even my mom she was very determined that I should do something secure and well paid and yeah. I remember because I kind of lost touch with her a bit in my 20s because we fell out and then like when I got back in touch I was speaking to her on the phone and she's like and and what are you doing with your life Ariane and I said um well I'm a writer and she went oh she's you lovely, she's got a lovely voice your mum She's very posh. She's very posh. She's like the queen because she's from the colonies because she's from East Africa. She grew up in um, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, and they are more British than the British. Yeah. Like, I swear, like all the all the East Africans, like, like Richard Dawkins. Uh, he's like yeah. East African, very, very posh. And like, anyway, so she's like, um, I said, I'm a writer, mom. She goes, oh, you need money. I'll send you money. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I'm, I'm actually doing okay. No, I'll send you some money. <laughs> like, That's quite she sweet. Was... Be quiet and take the money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's only like 200 quid, but it's still, you know, every little yeah. helps and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's just intensely, intensely um, 
competitive um yes like there is like a drive to promote diversity and and to promote minorities and and that's a good thing because like for years and years it was like an old boys club it was literally wall-to-wall white men um and so now the balance is being redressed a bit and i think that that's good um but it does mean that people like who are jealous kind of accuse you of only getting there because you're brown and female and it's like well i don't think that's true and i think especially like my songs like I love my songs and people have had such a kind of positive response to my songs and I think it's like if people actually listen to my songs then they'll they'll be like well no this person can write songs and she can sing and it doesn't matter that she's brown or female or anything it doesn't it you know you can't see the person while you're listening to the music you know, you know what um, really, made, really made me laugh on your Hitler mustache thing when you've kind of got the green screen backgrounds and that. It's your reluctant walk to the waxing parlor. <laughs> That's what made me laugh. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentionally <laughs> contrived in such a way, but that was the bit that made me really laugh. It's just like, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that it was only because I was wearing such high heels and I couldn't walk <laughs> in them. It wasn't. It wasn't meant to be reluctant, but yeah. Um, fortuitous. It was a fortuitous choice of footwear. Yeah, sometimes stuff works like that, and you don't know. Like <laughs> it just it just kind of falls in your favor. Like there's a bit in um I've got a um <laughs> a video called Love Song for Jeremy Corbyn, which is another comedy video. I watched that. And there's a bit where I throw his clothes in the bin, and the bin falls exactly in time to the music. And it's brilliant. And you can see me laughing in the video because it goes, um, uh, although all your clothing is fit for the bin, that won't be an issue when we're living in sin. (laughs) (laughs) But um, God, I wonder if Jeremy Corbyn has seen that. I I enjoyed the bit where you uh, reshuffled his cabinet. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. I had to kiss my mate John. My mate John, we got him um, to grow a beard. And then got <laughs> took him to a hairdresser and she shaped the beard and okay. his hair. And um, so he looked properly like Jeremy Corbyn. And then... Um, I was thinking that poor man, what have they put him through? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to simulate sex with him the whole time. <laughs> and um, I had to kiss him on the lips. And um, I'm very bad at kissing people that... I don't fancy or I'm not in a relationship with. I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could be an actress because I'd have to do love scenes and not that it's going to happen. I mean, <laughs> nobody's asking me to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. I can't do it. So I did like the tiniest kiss with him, like on the lips, like just like that. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was so much fun to do. Like it was totally no point to it. Didn't make me famous, didn't didn't um, get me any money, but it was it was just so much fun it cost over a grand to make with all the props and everything but you know sometimes you just have to do things because they're fun and actually you know that's what i'd say about stand-up and comedy like for you if it's something you want to do do it if if you get like successful through it that's a bonus yeah but you've got to just do things because you love them because most of the time nothing will happen it's like you know, I've done so many things where I thought this could go viral and it never did. And then the one thing that I just did like as a kind of throwaway thing and sort of slightly under duress and it wasn't something I really wanted to do. It was the Atheist Bus campaign. Yeah. And it went like, it was like front of every newspaper, like column pieces, wall to wall. Like it was on University Challenge. It was on Have I Got News For You? It's like suddenly I'm like propelled I'm like at the Groucho Club meeting people and it's like (laughs) this this wasn't meant to happen it was all the other fun stuff that was meant to go viral not this this is scary it's so strange it it really resonated at the time though didn't it It was it was it was an important time for that to appear as well and and, yeah and then Dawkins kind of what I I I think I read about or, or I heard you talking about how kind of Dawkins kind of got involved and offered to put up some money for it and that kind of thing as well. Yeah. All that stuff is just, it's unbelievable. You couldn't plan any of that, could you? you no, could- no, 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 no. If you told me that like Richard Dawkins would be sponsoring my campaign and, <laughs> you know, it would be running in 13 countries around the world, I wouldn't have believed you. I just thought you're crazy. And The things you post about your daughter are really cool. They're really funny. I watched her, oh, do, thank- I watched her do a magic trick the other day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, like 
she's so sweet and she's so confident and independent and kind of cool and aloof. She's kind of like the kid I wanted to be when I was a kid and I wasn't. <laughs> I was like this desperate, needy, friendless kid. And like now I've given birth to this like super cool kind of nonchalant kind she's of very chilled. She's, so even even when the camera is rolling, she's totally chilled, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, she is. She is. Your new, new, new album called Bitter, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's out next year. Um, once I've lost all the weight and I'm like hard bodied and looking all sexy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Dork it's, Dawkins um, won't like you anymore. No, 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 because he only <laughs> likes big girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was funny. <laughs> I hope he doesn't doesn't catch wind of that and sue me. But um, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, um, yeah. So that's coming out next year. That's super exciting because it's the first time that I've released like serious music, and yeah. it's coming out on a tiny little label called Bonoffi Sound Records, okay. and um, it's just it's really what I want to do in life. And yeah, I've, I've come to it late and, you know, releasing an album age 42 is, you know, the answer to life, the universe and everything. So, you know, maybe awesome. it's, it's fate. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like the video for London girl as well. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. It was cause I couldn't star in it. And I just thought I'd take some time-lapse footage. Um, but it's kind of like not, a love lesson to London. Uh, cause I'm fat. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have the confidence at the moment. And it's a shame because like people say, oh, Adele and Lizzo are fat. And it's like, yeah, but they've got A, amazing voices and B, like the young. And so it's like, I think you can have like one thing. If you're, if you're young and you've got an amazing voice, then being like plus size is not maybe the biggest issue. But look but at if it this way though, if, if Susan Boyle can star in her own videos, <laughs> and we're all fine aren't we <laughs> i've really enjoyed talking to you and uh, i probably didn't ask half of the things i intended to ask because we've just been kind of chatting on and i got, got immersed in a conversation but um I, maybe we can chat again another time maybe when your album comes out we can have a bit of a chat that would be so lovely i would absolutely love that thank you so much all right take care have a good take day care. See you, you too bye, -bye. bye.